Well, hello. Hope everybody is having a great Saturday, whether it is Saturday morning in your part of the country or Saturday a little bit after lunchtime. Uh, glad that you have joined us for this webinar. And if you will, let me just uh, hear from a couple of you to make sure that the audio, hey Roger, that the audio is working, video is working, and then we'll jump right into this. So uh, if you'll just let me know that everything is good. And okay, Let's see, Tammy says can't hear anything, but it looks like uh, everybody else can hear. So uh, Tammy, maybe just uh, refresh and uh, you know, then maybe it will, will work there for you. Okay, well, hey, good to see everybody on here. And you know, a lot of times what I have is we'll have a PowerPoint presentation or other type of materials. And in this one, I wanna keep it very simple and pretty focused. So in some previous webinars, we've talked first of all about how do you get your credit reports okay from equifax experian transunion and basically the best way to do that is through annualcreditreport.com and then how do we analyze those credit reports for errors we're looking for things that are inaccurate inconsistent incomplete okay things that just are, are flat out wrong or where there's contradictory information where it's just missing a bunch of data, okay? And then in the last webinar that we did, we talked about, well, how do we write the letter, okay? And again, there's no magic format to it. It's really just sitting down, preferably with two screens, if you have two screens, or maybe you've printed out your credit reports that are marked up, and just kind of looking at the report, then typing, you know, hey, Equifax, why are you missing January through September on the payment history for 2019 you know whatever it may be and we just type it out and really it's a lot of questions we say why do you say this over here when you say this over there or why are you missing this or why do you say my date of last payment was may 15 of 22 and the amount paid was zero how, how is that possibly right so we talked about those. If you happen to miss those, uh, I think both of those are on YouTube or just email me and I'll send you the links to them. And so what I want to talk about today is, all right, you've gotten your credit reports, you've analyzed them, you've sent off a dispute letter. Now you hear back from the credit bureau. What do you do? And I want to go over four kind of situations. One is you get what you know is often called a stall letter because that's exactly what it is. It'll be from the bureau saying, hey, we're not sure this is really you, or hey, you didn't give us your driver's license when you really did. And it's just a stall tactic. So what do we do with that? Now, a second option is they could delete the account that you disputed. It's always an option, either by the credit bureau or by the furnisher, the data furnisher, Capital One, Midland Credit, whoever it may be. Now, third option is they could fix all the errors. Well, hard to believe, but occasionally it happens they could decide hey you identified 37 errors on this account we fixed all those errors okay what do you do and then the fourth and this is by far the most common is they don't delete the account and they don't fix the errors so what do you do at that point so let me pull this up if i can share my screen here and this will just kind of keep us uh you, you know let you see it also as well as we'll talk about it so you know let's talk about this one right here this uh stall okay so let me see if i can make this bigger okay so uh, uh first of all let, let me know in the comments have any of you guys ever gotten a stall letter uh, and it's sort of it varies, you know, we'll go through a period where TransUnion's doing it, and then they, they stop doing it, and now Experian's doing it. Experian oftentimes is an email saying, hey, uh, we got something, it looks like a dispute, but we're suspicious, so we don't want to do anything to protect you. And uh, now Equifax is, at least in my practice, we're seeing Equifax do this a lot. 
So, yeah, it sounds like, uh, you know, some folks are getting those. And so what do we do with that? Well, here's the simple solution is, well, let, let me start with what not to do. Don't just get mad and don't get frustrated. You don't say, oh, this doesn't work. You know, I, I knew I could never fix my credit report or I knew I could never get rid of it. Don't, don't do that. That's what they want you to do. Here's the psychology of what they want. And I'm going to use very small numbers, but I want you to magnify this, okay? So let's say there are 100 people a day that the credit bureau sends a stall letter to. Really, it would, would be more like 10,000 a day, but let's just go with 100. Well, why do they do that? Well, now we have to back up even more and say, how does the credit bureau make money? They make money selling credit reports to users. So if you remember from a previous episode, we talk about there are credit bureaus, data furnishers, there's you, the consumer, and then there are users, people who buy credit reports. That's one way. The data furnishers who provide the information to the credit bureaus pay the credit bureaus, okay? You know how they don't make money is investigating your dispute. They make money selling you identity theft protection because they have such lousy controls that they allow identity theft. And so they make money that way, but they make no money on investigation. Investigations cost them money. So they say, okay, you know, we're pretty smart people. Let's take a hundred disputes, send a stall letter, send a stall email. And you know what happens? Like 90 of those hundred don't do anything. Just go away. So think about it from the credit bureau standpoint, we don't have to investigate anything. We got rid of 90% of the disputes. So we can lower our staff even more, lower our outsourcing even more. We don't have to do anything. It's fabulous. I mean, it's illegal, it's unethical, but hey, what do they care about that, right? So this is what they do. And the psychology, again, is that you won't do anything. Now, it could be because you are just demoralized, or it could be you're so angry, you're like, oh, I'm never dealing with these people again. Either way, they win. So we don't want to do that. It's okay to be upset. You should be upset. It's very annoying what they do. But let's channel that in a little different way. So every letter is different. Every email is different. So I'm not going to put any up on the screen, but just, just say, okay, I, I got this letter. I got this email. Let me read it very carefully. And usually it will say something like, hey, we think a credit repair place sent this. We think that uh, this is not really you or you didn't provide proof. And a lot of times you'll get that thing about you did not provide proof of identity when you exactly provided proof of identity. Here's the solution. Call them. They always give you a phone number. Call them. And now you have to make your own decision on this. I can tell you what folks that I represent do. As long as the credit bureau says, please be advised, all calls may be recorded or monitored, we record the call. So you record the call. And they say, hey, you know, this is Bob. How can I help you? You say, well, Bob, I got this weird letter, email, whatever, after I sent in a dispute. And I want to know what's going on. Oh, well, let me look up your information. So they identify who you are. And they look you up. And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we got something that we thought was kind of suspicious. Uh, we didn't think it came from you. It, it had a different zip code than where you live as if you can only mail something in the zip code where you live, okay? Now, I don't know about you guys, I've lived in places where my zip code is not really where I live, okay? It's just we were assigned as sort of overflow to kind of a distant post office that I never went to, okay? But just think about it, like if you, are in a certain part of Birmingham, Alabama, you cannot mail the letter from another part of Birmingham, Alabama, or they go, whoa, whoa, different zip code, must be fake. It's the dumbest thing ever, okay? People mail stuff at work, people mail stuff on their way, you know, running errands. Sometimes you grab letters and you may be going on vacation or a business trip and you drop them in, you know, a, a mailbox at the hotel, whatever it may be. So. Anyway, it's just, it's a stupid thing, okay? It's a very outdated thing because now we use mailing services 
like certifiedmetallabels.com. Uh, I think Letterstream is one of them. Uh, there's all sorts of services where you upload the document they mail for you. But go back to the phone call. Whatever they say, because they go, well, you know, we didn't think this was really you. you say, it, assuming it was, you go, yeah, yeah, that's my letter. You know, I, I approve that letter. I, I want you to investigate exactly those things in the letter. Now, have your letter in front of you. Now, if you're using a credit repair place that doesn't send you a copy of the letter before it gets mailed out, then I would not call the credit bureaus. I would fix that situation. Okay, do it yourself or get with a place that will actually let you look at the letters before they get mailed out. You should never have anything mailed out on your behalf before you look at it. So, but we're going to put that aside. Assume that either you mailed it or you read the letter, you approved it, and you said, yes, please mail this for me. And, and whether that's a credit repair company, whether that's your wife, your husband, your kid, your neighbor, hey, can you take this to the post office? Like, <laughs> this is how ridiculous the credit bureaus get. Like, well, if you did not physically type it, somebody else typed is no good. If you did not lick the envelope, if you did not fold the letter, if you did not lick the stamp, if you did not physically, it, it's just ridiculous what they did. So assuming that you were involved in this process and they say, we don't think that you sent that letter. You say, I did. I want you to investigate it. And usually they're kind of surprised by that. And they're like, well, you know, we weren't sure because it was different zip code. Yeah, I used a mailing service. Go ahead and investigate that. And sometimes what they'll say is, oh, well, as soon as we saw I had a different zip code, we threw it away. You go, really? You threw away my dispute letter. I have the right to dispute things. I told you what was wrong. I included my driver's license, proof of address, included the pages from your very credit report, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, that were marked up, and you just threw it away? Are you serious? Who made that decision? And then they get real nervous and squirt. Well, well, maybe we can find it. So yeah, yeah, I think you should go find my letter. Okay. Now other times they'll say, well, we didn't throw it away. We're just not doing anything with it. Say, so, well, now on the phone, I want you to investigate it. And sometimes they'll say, well, I, I don't have any access to it, so you need to remail the letter. You say, well, if I remail the letter, what's going to prevent this from happening all over again. And by the way, I've had clients that this exact conversation has happened. And the person at the credit bureau will go, oh, well, we won't do this again. Send the letter again. You know, five days later, get an email back. Hey, we got a suspicious thing. You know, we call back. What are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Okay. So it, here's a, a way around this. I mean, you certainly can remail the letter. It's just a pain. It's expense. It's time. But you could say, you know what? I'm not going to mail you the letter again. I'm going to do a dispute over the phone. I go, oh, okay. Well, tell me which account are you disputing? You say, I'm disputing 12 accounts. Let me read you my letter. They go, well, well wait a minute. You're going to do what? So, yeah, yeah. I'm going to read you my letter. Okay. Don't worry. It's, it's only 17 pages long with the attachments. Okay. I'll just read you everything. And make sure you take it down correctly and investigate it. And magically they'll say, you know what? We just found your letter. I think we can use it. Okay. And so this is one way, again, we, we don't just get mad. We say we can get upset and, and look, we're not mad at the, the individual person on the phone, right? They didn't make this. This is a corporate decision by Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, but we can be frustrated and we can be persistent and we can be the have the attitude of you will investigate these disputes okay so investigate my letter that you have i'll read you my letter okay or if you have to mail it again but but ask them specifically say what do i need to do in this letter so that you will not reject it improperly like you did this last one and, and let, let me get your name, your full name, your employee ID. I want to put that in my letter that I spoke with you on this date, and you told me that it would not be rejected again. And then again, they get really squirrely about that. I'm not allowed to give you that information. And, and look, if they reject it again, and these are valid disputes you've made, then at that point, you may just want to sue the credit bureau. Okay. But the, the bigger point with this stall thing is you just take whatever they say to you. 
And then you go back to them with that and you call them on the phone. You uh, say, hey, uh, investigate my letter. Let me read you my letter. And they'll try and push you to online because see, it's challenging to upload documents online. Now, I mean, we all know how to do it. I'm saying their websites are purposely designed so that there are all sorts of errors when you try to upload documents, okay? And it's designed to prevent you from uploading documents so that then they go, well, I mean, we didn't have any proof. We just had a little check mark where you said there were inaccuracies, but we didn't know what they were. So you want to be very careful doing it online. My point is be persistent, stay after them, and really, really push them on investigating your dispute. Or if you have to, send it again and see what they do. Because if they reject it a second time, now it's really, really bad for them. So that's my thought on that. Next, I want to turn to, they delete the account, but let me see if we have any questions here. Oh, let's see, are you gonna post this seminar on YouTube? Yes, yeah, it'll post. And also you should get an automatic email about an hour after we're done with a replay link to this. Uh, let's see, Latanya. We just received one from Experian last week, <clears throat> but I sent them all the requirements and asked them, how did they find my email without knowing who I was? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, so it just, I, I would do that phone call, Latanya. Just talk to them. You know, you, you've got my, obviously you, you know who I am. You got my email because you probably did not put your email in your, um, your letter, okay? And so investigate it. You know, and uh, we, we've had a couple of experiences with uh, Experian where they do one of two things. One, they say, we, we can't find your letter. And sometimes when you push them, they can find it. Other times they'll say, okay, we found it. And I'm gonna click a button to say, investigate. You just say, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your help. This was very upsetting to me. I appreciate you helping me. And so that would be my suggestion there. Let's see, uh, Merle asked a question about the credit bureaus don't fix the errors. We're going to come back to that here in just a moment. Um, see, Kiana, Experian sent me one last week after requesting updates to my personal information, provide all the identification necessary. Yeah, so what happens is you, uh, a lot of times you'll give them everything they need, and they just send you this form letter back saying, give me the things that you already gave them. And so one time, we had our client right across the top of the page second and final notice okay kind of like a collection letter and sent that back they still rejected it we sued them and you know to see them sort of sputtering around trying to explain why they rejected our letter for not having a driver's license when their own file showed two letters with two driver's licenses kind of hard to explain and Mohammed asked about an FCRA FTCPA attorney in New York. So there's um, Rachel, uh, her last name's escaping me. I'll, I'll pull it up in a minute. Uh, there's Subhan Tariq in uh, New York. Let me pull up Rachel real quick. Yeah, Rachel uh, Kugel. And um, let me see here. I don't know if this will easily let me copy it. We'll see. I'll put it in the uh, thing here. And um, so let me go on to this next uh, item here, and then we'll come back to the questions. So what if they delete the account? I mean, it's pretty simple. That's great, okay? Because my rule is, and not everybody agrees with this, but yeah, this is, I'm giving you our approach from doing this for two decades now. Our approach is you only dispute something that you would be happy if it got deleted. So if you've got a 20-year-old account and five years ago there's one 30-day late, don't dispute it because they can always delete it. That is always an option. I'm always amazed that people would act surprised over this because the FCRA, Fair Credit Reporting Act, is extraordinarily clear about this. 
A bureau can delete the account. A furniture, data furniture, like Capital One, like Bank of America, Chase Bank, whoever it may be, they can delete the account. That's always an option. So if they delete the account, you go, great. Really, the only thing to do after this is just to make a note of it and to be watching your credit report. Sometimes it'll be deleted and then reinserted. If it's reinserted without you being notified by the credit bureau, that's a problem with this sort of caution. On collection accounts, people get confused about this. They say, all right, it was uh, Midland and I disputed it, Midland came off. And then the same debt was reinserted. We say, well, so Midland's back on there. Oh, no, no, now it's portfolio recovery. Well, that's not reinsertion. That's a different company, different account number, okay? So reinsertion is where you dispute your Capital One account, it's deleted, and then Capital One brings that same account back on. Now you have a claim for that, okay? But I'll just tell you this, it is very rare that that happens. You know, maybe every 50 people that tell me it's happened, when we actually look at it, maybe one, okay? I mean, it just, it, it doesn't happen very often, at least in my experience. And I look at hundreds and hundreds of credit reports uh, really a month. So uh, I, I don't think you, it's very likely that that will happen, okay? But look, deletion is great because when we dispute something, we're saying, I want you to fix it or delete it. That's what we're saying, fix it or delete it. So if they delete it, hey, that's great. I got rid of this charge off account, this repossessed you know, uh, car account. Now keep in mind, the deletion of an account does not mean the debt has gone away. So I think I did a video on this, I don't know, maybe six months ago, talking about the, the cow and the tail, okay? So the old expression is the cow can live without the tail, but the tail cannot live without the cow, right? It's kind of obvious. I mean, you pull a cow and a tail apart, the cow's still alive, but the tail is not alive. The debt is the cow, okay? The credit reporting is the tail. All right, so we may get rid of the credit reporting. It doesn't make the debt go away. It just means the credit reporting has gone away. Now, if you get rid of the debt itself, if you get rid of the cow, now the credit reporting is going to have to follow, okay? In whatever way that means. Maybe it's supposed to be a zero balance. Maybe it's supposed to be deleted. But the point is, it gets deleted. Hey, that's a good thing. I would be happy about that. All right, so let's see. Uh, Go back to the comments. Yeah, Brian Ponder is, I always forget what Brian, either he lives in Atlanta, but he's licensed in New York or vice versa. But yeah, there's Brian Ponder. Uh, probably the easiest place to go to is if you go to this, uh, the consumeradvocates.org has a place where you can search and then there's a YouTube video in there where I just, I don't know, it's three or four or five minutes just talking about how to use that website. And it doesn't mean everybody in there is perfect. Everybody's going to be the perfect fit for you, but it gets you a start. Okay. All right. Let's see here uh, what we've got. Uh, Latanya, they deleted one inaccurate account on my letter, but forgot the other account I disputed. Yeah. So we're, we're going to come to that. So it's a great point. So think of your dispute letters like this box, okay? You put all the accounts you're disputing for, let's say, Equifax in there. And then when you get the box back from Equifax and the results of investigation, you say, okay, what'd you guys do? Did you delete all the accounts? Great. Did you fix all the accounts? Great. Did you delete or fix all the accounts? Great. But what if they skip some? Well, that's where we go to the next step here. Well, actually, we'll we'll just cover this briefly. This fix all the errors, okay? And then we'll get to the you know the more interesting part, which is what if they don't delete, they don't fix. So, what if they fix the stuff? Well, you've got to look at a couple of things. Did they actually fix all the errors or just one of them? You know, if I take my car in, I say I need a new transmission and the front axle's broken and my brakes are out and the air conditioner's not working. And they call me and they say, hey, your car's ready, come pick it up. And I get there and all they did was fix the AC. I'm like, well, I appreciate you fixing the AC, but where's the rest of the stuff that you're supposed to fix? 
the axle, the brakes, the transmission. Okay. So if they don't fix everything, then we've got a problem and they've got a problem. But let's say they truly fix everything. Perfect. You accomplish the mission. If they delete it, you accomplish the mission. If they fix the errors, you accomplish the mission. We can't be upset because we have accurate credit reporting. You know, and sometimes people misunderstand that. They say, well, I thought I wasn't supposed to have any inaccurate credit reporting. No, you, you, can have, uh, you can have accurate credit reporting as long as it is negative. And let me just say that the other way. You can have negative credit reporting as long as it's accurate. Accurate credit reporting, negative or positive, that's fine as long as they stay within the rules. Where the problem is, is when it is negative and it is inaccurate, then they have a problem. Because if you disputed it properly and they come back and they don't fix every error, then we're at this final stage here. And I'll go ahead and I don't think we need to keep sharing this here. I can remember how to, uh, yeah, to stop sharing it. So let's talk about the most likely thing. We've talked about what they stall, what if they delete, what if they fix. What if they don't fix? They don't delete. So you've got a couple options here. One option would be that, kind of like we talked about with the stall letter, pick up the phone, you call them, okay? Easiest thing is put this on, um, put it on speakerphone and then record it on your laptop, your tablet, another cell phone. And again, you have to make your own decision on recording. But you just go through, and we, we did a whole session on this, but here's the short version. You go through and you say, tell me what you did. I, I got these results of investigation back. Tell me what you did in your investigation. And they'll say, well, what, what, what do you mean? We investigate. Go, I understand that, but what did you do? Did you call somebody? Did you write a letter? Did you send an email? Did you go visit Chase Bank? Like, tell me what you did. They go, oh, well, we, uh, we passed your letter along to Chase Bank. So, okay, what else did you do? Well, that's it. They came back and told us what to do. And a lot of times the people over the phone will be very honest about this. They'll say, look, we don't do anything. I mean, we just send it to the furnisher and whatever they tell us to do, we do. Now, it's very much against the law. We love to have that testimony, okay? That's why a recorded phone call can be so powerful. And so that's one option. Another option is you could send another dispute letter, okay? And you might reference the first one, say, this is my second time disputing this. And, you know, I, I told you these 27 errors, you fixed two of them, what about the other 25? Or like uh, I think Latanya mentioned, uh, hey, you did delete that one Capital One account, but what about that other Capital One account? You know, why didn't you do anything with that? Let me tell you again what's wrong. Now, I think I've mentioned this in another video. In my practice, we always want the original credit report. And then that is what creates the dispute letter. And then we get the results. And then we get another credit report. Okay. So that you have sort of the full picture here and know exactly what they did, what they did not do. And so you, you just type all that up. Okay. You know, you might include your first dispute letter if, if it's appropriate. And so you do that. So you could call them and dispute over the phone. You could write them another letter. You could obviously do both. You could call them, they don't fix it. You write another letter. You know, I mean, you can do as much as you want. But another option is to sue them, okay? And that's where you're suing under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And there's different strategies, okay? And I've done all these that I'm about to tell you. Sometimes we lump them all in in one case. So. Uh, we recently see uh, Verizon Wireless and the three bureaus, okay? So four defendants in one case. That's a perfectly fine way of doing it. Other times we break those cases up into pieces. You know, we say, here's a separate lawsuit against Equifax. And then it might be filed the same day or a week later, or a month later, or six months later. Here's Experian and TransUnion. And, you know, each of the five furnishers, they get a separate lawsuit. Now, it's more expensive in terms of a filing fee, but assuming that, you know, you don't care about that, and, and I would hope you're using a lawyer, and your lawyer shouldn't really care about, you know, whether we're spending 500 bucks or $2,000 on filing fee, but it has some advantages. It's just easier to handle, 
because when we're trying to schedule something, if we have eight defendants, that's at least eight sets of lawyers. Usually it's more like 10 or 12. And to try to schedule something is very difficult. It's easy if there's one, you know. And plus, each defendant has to stand on their own instead of kind of like, uh, well, I'm not a NASCAR fan, but what do they call it, where you're like drafting behind the car? What we see is, you know, one defendant will kind of take the lead and the rest just fall in line. Well, if you sort of strip all that away and they, they are sued individually, they can't do that, okay? The downside is you could be deposed multiple times, but I've never seen that happen. So the, the point is you can sue, and this is where I'll, I'll mention a couple things. So for some reason, there was this sort of popular concept that it's best to do this without a lawyer. And I've never understood that because you give up so much of the leverage by not having a lawyer. And look, I'm not asking any of you to use me. This is not self-serving, okay? This, I'm just being very blunt with you. A large factor in these cases is one, the attorney's fees, but even more important than the attorney's fees, which you only get if you have a lawyer. But more important than that is just the lawyers on the other side know, okay, you have a lawyer who knows what he or she is doing. And so they skip a lot of stuff. When I see people doing this on their own, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I can't tell you how many people come to me with cases that maybe are $50,000, $100,000 cases, and they filed these in small claims court. I go, why, why'd you file in small claims court? They're like, oh, well, this lawyer online told me we should all file our stuff in small claims court. And, and if we do that, it can't be removed, which is completely bogus, by the way. They can take it to federal court. But they don't usually anymore. They just leave them in state court because I know the lawyers that defend these in state court. And they're like, John, you know, we win like 95% of these cases, maybe 99%, because the consumer doesn't show up or they show up and they have no proof. They're like, oh, well. I watched on this video, they said, if I just filed a small claims court, you guys would roll over and pay me money. And the bureau lawyer's like, nope, we're here. We're ready to try it, your honor. And so even if you get a couple thousand dollars out of it, you know, people will say, oh, look at me. This is fantastic. I got $2,000 out of this. And I'm like, yeah, that was a $100,000 case. You would have got like 50 grand after the lawyer fee. So my point is I would always go to an experienced lawyer who knows what he or she is doing, start with somebody in your state and say, hey, here's my situation. Do you think that I have a case and are you interested in it? The lawyer should tell you, I mean, some will ignore you, but what they should tell you is, no, I don't think you have a case. Yes, I do think you have a case. Or you may have a case, but we need to do a couple more things. Maybe we need to dispute again. Maybe there's sort of a little gap somewhere and we need to fill that gap dispute again. Maybe you need to go apply for credit and that will help demonstrate your damages. Maybe they know in their particular district or their state or what's called their circuit. Okay, so we have different courts of appeals. So I'm in the 11th circuit, which is Alabama, Georgia, Florida. They may say, well, in my circuit, we really need a credit turned down. Okay, well then they'll, help you think about, you know, do you, were you wanting to apply for a house, a car, a credit card, a signature loan, whatever you need to do. So that would be my suggestion. If you go it alone, not to say that you can't do it, but I can tell you the bureaus absolutely love it when you don't have a lawyer. And, you know, there's a an idea of going in arbitration, usually not against the bureaus, although sometimes against Experian because they have an arbitration provision. If you've ever signed up like Experian.com or credit works, but uh, take, you know, a bank. Well, I can tell you, because I see these banks and I know their lawyers, I know what they do. A lot of these banks have just a blanket policy. If you are doing this pro se or you have some non-lawyer representing you in arbitration, they will pay you zero. And a lot of times I'll even tell the person, look, if you'll go get a real lawyer, we'll pay your lawyer and you money, but we're not paying you a penny, okay? And so I'm not saying every bank does that, but I can say that's a growing trend because they are getting sued and arbitration claims with so much sort of garbage claims. 
that they've just decided this is worth it. So when I first started practicing law in 1995, there was sort of a rule of thumb in Alabama that a car wreck case would be worth three times your medical bills. Okay, not three times what your insurance company paid for, but three times sort of like the retail price of the, the medical care. And Allstate came in after having, I think it's McKinsey consultants help them with this to say, you know what, on these minor impact soft tissue, those are called MIST, M-I-S-T, minor impact soft tissue, Let's offer $1,000. We don't care if there's $15,000 in medical bills. Let's just offer a thousand. And you know, the pushback was, well, we're gonna have to try these cases. We're gonna spend more than it would take us to settle. And they, the consultant said, don't worry about it because you're gonna send a message to all the lawyers. Don't bring these minor impact soft tissue cases against us. You're gonna lose money. And so that's what we're starting to see the banks do, even in arbitration, where you're representing yourself or you have like a credit repair place representing you, which, first of all, is the unauthorized practice of law. And in certain states, they will go after the credit repair place. That's a crime to do that. And so uh, but even putting that aside, the banks are starting to say, no, we're not going to pay you any money okay? because we want to stop this. All right. So my point is I would go to a lawyer who knows what he or she is doing and say, here's everything, okay? And now here's a suggestion. The initial contact, email, fill out a form, give them a summary, okay? I, I, I get, I don't know, five or six a day of people saying, um, I need you to tell me right now that you will represent me against the credit bureau and six furnishers and that I'm going to put at least $150,000 in my pocket. And I'm like, I, I don't know this person, you know, delete, right? There's, there's no information in there. What I do like is when somebody says, hey, uh, I've made three disputes. I've got these three accounts. I identified the errors. And if you would like, I'd love to send you my dispute letter, the results, and the new credit reports. Well, see, now I go, okay, this person's organized. Maybe I can do something with this. Maybe I can help them. But, you, you know, when I get stuff, and my favorite is when they say, uh, I need to know whether you'll represent me. And I say, well, let me see your stuff. They go, well, I, you don't need to see it. I told you. I disputed it. I, I identified the errors, and they didn't fix it. Will you or will you not represent me? I thought you were supposed to represent me. And I go, well, I got to look at it. It's like saying to a doctor. I need you to do surgery on me tomorrow and you cannot look at my medical records and you cannot look at the x-rays. Like what? It, it's just weird. I don't know why that happened. So my point is make it easy for a lawyer. Give them the steps, give them kind of the outline and say, I am happy to share information with you, but you know, I'll get emails that have like 60 attachments and they're like, if you just will go through all this, I know it's disorganized, just sort of put it all together and kind of figure out what's going on. And I'm like, I, I got clients that I represent. You're not my client. I'm not going to spend any time doing that. You have to be organized if you want to bring it to me. And I think most lawyers that do what I do, and there's not many of us, but most lawyers would feel the same way. So that's my suggestion for you guys. And let me go back through the, um, the questions here. So... All right, this was an earlier one from Murley. If credit bureaus don't fix errors, should the data furnisher, such as the original creditor, bear more responsibility? The original creditor doesn't provide accurate information. Can the credit bureaus be held accountable? How much is each party responsible? It's a great question. So you have to kind of think about it in this way. The So let's say this is a credit bureau and this is the furnisher. The credit bureau can't get any information on this account except from the furnisher. So the furnisher sends the information. They have an obligation, it's under section 1681 S2A, to be accurate and complete when they send that information to the credit bureaus. But what if they don't? Well, then if you dispute it, now the credit bureau is supposed to go back to the furnisher and say, hey, what's going on here? But if the credit bureau either before that or once the furnisher responds, says, you know what, this doesn't look accurate. This doesn't look complete. They're supposed to delete, okay? So as a friend of mine, Mike Cardoza says, if it's incomplete, you must delete, all right? 
And so in that situation, they bear equal responsibility, okay? From the standpoint that yes, the furnisher, when they're notified by the credit bureau, the chief dispute, Merley, they have to do their own investigation and they need to tell the credit bureau, here's everything that's accurate and complete, or they should tell the credit bureau, delete. The credit bureau should look at it and say, is this accurate? Is this complete? Is this verifiable? And if not, delete it. Now, in practice, the way this turns out is usually we require more money out of the furnisher, partially for the reason Merley mentioned, like doesn't seem like they have more responsibility. It's not necessarily that they have more responsibility, but here's what I want you to think about. Let's say I dispute a Capital One account on Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and Innovus, okay? And those four bureaus notify Capital One. And Capital One is reporting inaccurate, incomplete information. And they get four separate notices from those four bureaus. And each of those four times, Capital One says, keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it, okay? We're not changing anything. And they're leaving it inaccurate, incomplete. So let's think about this for a minute. Are the bureaus at fault? Absolutely. If you point out to them, you've circled stuff, you've drawn arrows, you've you know, marked that the credit report, and they can see from their own data that it's inaccurate, incomplete. Well, then each bureau is responsible for that. But think about Capital One. Four times they sent inaccurate, incomplete information. Now, you can't sue for the initial sending of the data, okay? Because that's under that 1681 S2A. There's no what's called private right of action. You can't sue for it. But once you notify a bureau who then notifies the furnisher, now you're under 1681 S2B. And that you can sue for if the, the furnisher does not make sure that it's accurate and complete. So in my example, they blew the law, even though you can't sue them, you know, those first four times. But then they messed it up with Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and Innovus. So four times. Plus, they have a contract with each one of those credit bureaus where they promise to only report accurate and complete. So they violate the law, 1681 S2A, you can't sue for it, but they still violate law. They violate the contract, and they violate 1681 S2B. So from that standpoint, we look at that and we say, yeah, each bureau who did not delete or make accurate, each bureau is responsible, and Capital One's responsible. Now, are they four times as responsible? Do we make them pay twice or three times? Well, it varies, okay? Sometimes they are providing accurate information to the bureaus and the bureaus are messing this up. Well, now it's all gonna be on the bureaus, not on Capital One. So it does depend, but it's a very good question. Hopefully that gives you some insight in it. All right, let's see here. Um, uh, Keisha said, first time here, I have to leave, attend a funeral, replay be available. Yeah, so uh, you should get a replay link, and I'll also put this on YouTube uh, when I get a chance. All right, uh, Latanya, can you go over comparisons disputes with the CRAs? So I think what, and maybe this is a follow-up, I disputed with PRA about the inaccurate information, and they told me they aren't responsible for what the CRAs do with the information they report. So. I think what you may be talking about is, hey, what if we sort of lay all these credit bureaus side by side and they have different open dates, they have different dates of first delinquency, which actually Equifax is the only one that gives you the date of first delinquency. A TransUnion Experian will give you a, a, either an estimated date or they'll just say this is when it will be removed. Uh, there may be a different last payment amount or, you know, we just did a dispute I think two days ago where we said, hey, Experian, you say in this month we were current, but TransUnion says we we're 30 days late and Equifax says we we're 60 days late. I don't know. <laughs> like maybe none of those are right, but only one, it, the, at most one can be right. So I need you guys to get together. So, you know, we point this out to all the bureaus and to the furniture, like, hey, what's going on here? So that's certainly a way to do it. It takes a little bit more time to kind of compare each bureau. Now, it's easier if you're using something like uh, Identity IQ, Smart Credit that, you know, lays everything out. The problem is, in my experience, the data is not very accurate and it's not the real data. 
Okay. So it, it's super easy for Equifax to go, yeah, you go, well, look, here's my smart credit or identity IQ or fill in the blank. And they go, not our data. Okay. And I've compared, you know, the real reports with those. And there's a reason I don't use those. Okay. I've tried them and they're very nice looking. They're very convenient, certainly very easy, you know, for software to kind of pick out errors. But the problem is if the data is bad, like, you know, in the, the, you know, sort of tri-merge report, then your dispute letter is going to be bad. So we need the real data from Equifax, the real data from Experian, the real data from TransUnion. And, but if you take the time to, to lay it all out, yeah, that can be very, very effective. And typically if you're doing that type of thing, you want to put all three bureaus on the same letter so that you can kind of talk to all of them. It's like you're sitting in a room and you go, hey, Equifax, why do you say 30 days late? Hey, Experian, why do you say 60? And TransUnion, why do you say that I was current? Like, uh, can y'all figure this out, you know? And so that's one way to do it. All right, uh, Kiana, would you recommend same dispute process for the secondary bureaus, LexisNexis? Yeah, I mean, Innovis, Clarity, LexisNexis, um, you know, there's uh, DataX, there's Factor Trust, there's, I mean, literally there are hundreds of these sort of specialty credit bureaus. Now, Innovis would not be considered a specialty. They're, you know, kind of the fourth credit bureau. They're just way behind on the fourth, fourth place. But yeah, these sort of subprime ones. So each bureau has a subprime credit report. So Clarity for Experian, um, Factor Trust for TransUnion, Data X for Equifax. And then there's, you know, medical type stuff. There's LexisNexis, which is really kind of combining, you know, multiple sort of specialty reports. Uh, it's definitely worth getting your LexisNexis report and checking that out and, and getting all of these. Every credit report you can get for free once a year. Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, you can get once a week. And in my experience, you can get Innovus more than once a year. Okay. And whether you do that online, whether they mail it to you. So definitely, yeah, same process for all of these. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Anita Michelle says, you have any consumer lawyers for Louisiana? I'll just put in the chat again, in case you came on a little bit later. Uh, go to consumeradvocates.org, and there's also a video that's listed there. Uh, it's my video, just sort of walking you through how to use that. It's a good place to start to find somebody. All right, uh, let's see. Latanya, if it's incomplete, you must delete. Uh, I love that. So, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of borrowing on the OJ Simpson trial, right? You know, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. So uh, uh, Mike Cardoza, who's in Southern California, is, uh, first of all, a great lawyer, a uh, good friend of mine, and a uh, very clever guy. And so uh, give him credit for that saying. Let's see, DeMarcus, why are some of the courts holding the consumer can't just allege mere procedural violations? Did that transient versus Ramirez affect the way lawyers like yourself represent us in a positive way or negative way? Yeah, so great question, DeMarcus. There's this concept of standing, and uh, it, let me take a step back. Federal courts are courts of what are called limited jurisdiction. So we have to prove that they have what's known as subject matter jurisdiction. And so that goes to Article 3 of the Constitution, which says they have the power to hear cases or controversies. And so the courts have interpreted that to mean it has to be a number of factors. We'll only focus on one is the idea of standing or a concrete injury. And the court in an earlier case called Spokio, which is a type of credit bureau, and then later in the TransUnion versus Ramirez, that just a, what they call a bare procedural violation doesn't get you into federal court. So now if you've alleged damages, okay, that almost always counts, but you ask how it's affected us. Uh, a lot of consumer lawyers, there are cases they used to take, they no longer will take. And, and, and look, I'm not critical of anybody's approach. I'll, I'll just tell you the approach we've taken for many, many years and that I was sort of pounding the, the drum on this for many years and people thought I was crazy. And now suddenly maybe I'm not so crazy. 
we've been preaching for so long, you file these cases in state court. And if the defendant leaves it in state court, great, you're in state court. I mean, you get a jury trial, state court judge can handle a Fair Credit Reporting Act case just fine. Normally they will remove the case. So here you are in state court, they'll take it, remove it to federal court. Well, let's go back to what I said. To get into federal court, you have to prove it's a case or controversy. And one of those things is you have to have standing, which means concrete damages or injury. Well, if I file the case in federal court, guess who bears the burden of proving standing? It's me. And any point throughout the case, if the judge goes, you know, I don't think you have standing, boom, case is dismissed. Now, it's not dismissed with prejudice. It's not that they rule in favor of the defendant. They just go, we don't have power to hear this case. You have to leave this court. Some states have, I'm getting a little bit in the weeds here, but some states have what's called a savings clause. It says if you get kicked out of federal court for lack of standing, you have X period of time to refile the case in state court and you're okay with statute of limitations. My state doesn't have that. Alabama doesn't have that. So if there's a violation of the law, the next day I file suit, and then two years goes by, which is typically the statute of limitation for FCRA, and then the judge goes, oops, sorry, guys, uh, got a dismissed case for lack of standing. I'm out of luck, okay? But if I file in state court and they remove it to federal court, now who bears the burden of proving standing? Not me. I didn't ask to be in federal court. So the way I, you know, will mention this to judges is, you know, it's whoever, hopefully you can hear that, it's whoever knocks on the door of the federal courthouse. They have to prove standing, not me. So we have defendants that will remove a case to federal court and then say, judge, there's no standing. And we're like, okay, you didn't think that through very well, did you? Because <laughs> you told the court when you took the case into federal court, there was standing. And then you immediately say there's not standing. Some judges will sanction the defense lawyers for doing that because it's absurd, you know, to say, judge, this belongs in federal court. And by the way, judge, this can never stay in federal court. What are you doing? You're wasting time. So what we find is we file them in state court 99% of the time it gets removed. I don't care if it doesn't get removed. If it gets removed to federal court, then, and I tell the lawyers this, they go, why do you file everything in state court? I said, because I never want to hear the word Spokio, or now the case people talk about is the Ramirez case. I never want to hear those words come out of your mouth. And they kind of laugh a little nervously. And they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I'm like, yeah, we're not doing standing here. The moment you breathe a word about standing, I'm going to say, judge, I'm ready to go back to state court. And see, these lawyers typically are terrified of being in state court. There's some comfort for them to be in federal court. This federal court, although it does differ by place, it's pretty uniform, okay, but maybe totally different in Alabama state court or Wyoming state court or New York state court. So to answer your question, it hasn't affected what we do because we've been doing this a long time, and uh, but it has affected the way other lawyers practice. Let's see, Mohammed, New York majority attorney are not helpful. Well, sorry to hear that. Maybe check out the ones I mentioned. Uh, I know Subhan uh, Tariq does a lot of FCRA work. Um, and I mean, there's got to be probably 20 lawyers in New York that do stuff. I would just check out that NACA website. All right, what are the next steps after the credit bureau doesn't do an investigation, respond is validated? Well, it's a great point, James. I guess I should have put that on our list. What if they just don't respond at all? Well, then you want to make sure you can prove they got your dispute. Now, if you send it regular mail, you can't prove it. There's sort of the idea they probably got it, but you can't prove it. So we send everything certified mail, okay? Uh, but if they don't respond, you could call them. Hey, I sent you guys a letter and let me see here. I uh, got delivered on June the 8th. I haven't heard back from you. Did you guys get my letter? Did you investigate it? Can you send me the results of investigation? Uh, or you may just want to pull a new credit report after the period of time for them to investigate. And then you kind of compare that with your letter, right? And you say, well, I disputed these accounts. They fixed nothing, deleted nothing. Okay. Or maybe they deleted a couple, but not all. And then you go through the same process. So I'll just tell you with Experian, 
maybe 50% of the time, we never get results investigation. I don't care. You know, we give them the time period, then we pull a new credit report, whatever's not fixed, not deleted, we sue. And we're like, apparently they didn't even do any investigation, okay? But even if they did and forgot to tell us, they didn't fix everything. Now, sort of the caution I'll give you, the danger if a credit bureau does not do an investigation is they would not then notify the furnisher. So remember, you send the letter to the furnisher, they're supposed to, I mean, the, uh, the bureau, they're supposed to notify the furnisher. If they don't notify the furnisher, you can't sue the furnisher. Now, if you send a letter to Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, and only Experian doesn't notify, but Equifax and TransUnion do notify, and, and stuff doesn't get fixed on Equifax and TransUnion, yeah, you can still sue the furnisher. But if, let's say, there's an error only on Experian, and Experian does not notify the furnisher, you can't sue them. So this is also a reason why, kind of getting into the details of the strategy, but it's a reason why we start off suing the credit bureau. And then we say to the credit bureau, did you investigate or did you not? It's really bad if they don't investigate, assuming we have a legitimate dispute. Now, if we have a bogus dispute, it doesn't matter. But if we have a legitimate dispute, they don't investigate, it's a big problem for them. Let's say they go, oh, sure, we investigated. And we sent the ACDV, the Automated Consumer Dispute Verification Form, to the furnisher. And we go, okay, give that to us. And we get it back and we see it was sent in a timely manner and Capital One responded to it. Well, then when we sue Capital One in a separate suit, instead of kind of having to guess and say, we, it's called pleading in the alternative, uh, where we might say, well, they were notified or they weren't notified. You know, if separate suit against the furniture, we would only say they were notified. But rather than just saying that, it's much better to say, and they were notified by Experian on June the 12th at 2.33 p.m., and they responded on this day with the, the Capital One or whoever gets that lawsuit, and they're like, oh, man, they got all the documents. So it's another reason. Sue the credit bureau, get the information, then sue each furnisher separately. So I hope that helps you there. All right, uh, Mohammed, what should you use, annual credit report or Experian, Equifax, Strangey? I, I prefer annualcreditreport.com. Uh, Equifax.com, unless it's changed recently, makes it hard to sort of print out your whole report. Uh, TransUnion looks fine. Experian looks fine. You, you may get tied up in some arbitration provisions, which, you know, it's not my favorite thing, but we deal with arbitration a lot. Uh, but I just like to go to annualcreditreport.com. I think you get the most data, which is what you want, because the most data means you can find the most number of errors, the most number of incompletes, and that gives you a basis to dispute. So I prefer annualcreditreport.com. You can go once every seven days for each credit report there. So it's fabulous. All right, uh, Latanya, use data from each credit bureau, sent them a copy of my report. That's good. Very good. Uh, Merley, when you do discovery of credit bureaus, do they have to reproduce the letters you wrote so judge can see transparency? Yeah, uh, they should have that and they should produce that. Now, sometimes we attach our letters redacted, you know, like any account number, date of birth, social security. Uh, we attach that to the lawsuit sometimes or we drop it into the lawsuit so the judge can see it. Uh, particularly to see, you know, the report's been marked up. So we call this the show and tell method, right? Like being back in school, you show and tell. We show them the credit report and it's all marked up and look at this, like Equifax will say, date of first delinquency is January, 2020. And you go up to the payment history chart, January, 2020, it's got a green check mark by it. You're like, how does that work? So you circle, circle, draw a line. So we show them and then we tell them in words in the letter. Okay, and a lot of times we put all that in front of the judge. But yes, the credit bureau has got to show that they received your letter and you know, did they send it? Did they not send it on to the furnisher? All right, uh, let's see. Keanu says, pull my Lexus Nexus found two judgments filed against me 2016, 2017. Don't recall being served for either through a loophole because nothing is on the big three for these. Don't know what to do now. Okay. Great question, sorry that happened. Let's, let's take a few things from this. The big three, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and Innovus, to my knowledge, 
do not ever report judgments anymore. They used to, but they don't anymore. Or I, I'd say this, I don't know if any of us used to. Equifax Experience Training you definitely reported judgments. Uh, I no longer see them reporting judgments. But LexisNexis will. So if you have some judgments that you don't recall being served on, I would get with a lawyer and pull that information, okay? And whatever state you're in, there should be something in the court file that is proof of service. Now, you have to understand what does service mean being served in your state, okay? Your state at that time. Does not necessarily mean they have to hand it to you. So in Alabama, we can serve people by certified mail, but there are certain restrictions. Other states, you can't do that. Um, in Alabama, we can serve somebody who lives in the house, not a guest, not the neighbor, not your cousin staying over the weekend, but somebody lives in the house. If we serve that person and they are of suitable age and discretion and they just throw it away, you're still served. Okay. I don't like that, but that's like, you got to know what the rules are. Okay. And then you've got to sort of go back in time and figure out how it would have been impossible for you to be served. So, you know, I have all sorts of videos on this on my YouTube channel, but were you in surgery that day? Were you out of town? You know, were you stuck at work because you're a nurse and there was no happening and they wouldn't let you leave the facility. You have to prove it would be impossible to have been served. OK, and then with the lawyer's help, you file a motion to vacate that judgment because you weren't served. And then once the judgment's vacated, it doesn't make the lawsuit go away, but makes the judgment go away. Then you take that vacated judgment order along with the original order. And so you have the original that says $5,000 judgment. Then you have the more recent order that says we vacate the judgment. And you send that to LexisNexis and you say, look, you guys were reporting this judgment. It's no good. I, you know, challenge this judgment. The judge agreed, vacate it, now get it off. They get it off, great. They don't, you sue them, okay? All right, let's see. Uh, Latanya Child Support doesn't put any data first delinquency on purpose. Keep the account reporting. Any thoughts on this? Well, I'll say this. If it's negative, okay, I, I suppose child support might be positive, but every time I've seen it's negative, it has to have a date of first delinquency, unless there's something that I'm just not aware of with child support. Uh, but I'm trying to think if I've ever had a child support credit bureau case. I'm not sure I have, okay? But I don't ever remember seeing anything that says, here's an exception for child support. Because the reason we have to have the date of first delinquency on any negative account is to know when it will come off. If the credit bureau does not have the date of first delinquency, they have no idea when to take it off. So they have to know that. And so I would challenge the bureaus on that, okay? What is the date of first delinquency for this? And, you know, that's definitely something, get with a consumer lawyer who does this type of work in your state to help you draft that letter to get it, you know, sort of make sure it's getting at the information that you need. All right, Tammy says, did dispute with Equifax. They claimed a disclosure of my consent when the furnisher was provided, giving permission to report account, but not provide a copy of the disclosure. Uh, so, okay, a couple issues here. So let, let's kind of back up. One is, did that furnisher have a right to pull my credit report? Okay, permissible purpose, which is different than permission. Do they have a permissible purpose to pull my credit report? Well, the credit bureau is not going to have to show you, you know, like the application that you signed or the loan applicant, whatever it may be. Uh, I do think they have to show you where the user, if you specifically ask for this and what's called your complete file, if the user, they had to give a reason, a permissible purpose and sign a certification. Okay? So I think you are entitled to that. Now, if you're asking, well, where's the permission for Capital One, for example, to credit report on me? Well, th that's in you know every contract that they say we have the right to credit report. So it's not really something the credit bureau has to show you. If you think that you never were notified, and again, it's not quite permission. It's not that you have to say, okay, Capital One, I agree, you can. No, it's in the contract. They say. If you use our credit card, 
then you understand that we do credit report. That's all they have to do. But that's really something, if you think that doesn't exist, get with Capital One about that, okay? Equifax is gonna say, well, look, we, we don't know. You know, that's not really our thing. So go to the furnisher about that. Uh, how would we know they notified the furnisher? I mean, before litigation, you could call Equifax and say, what did you do in the investigation? Okay, so let me go back. I think actually I didn't finish what I was talking about with the call. You say, what did you do? And then you say, I want you to investigate again and then give me my complete file. But in that first part where you say, what did you do in the investigation? You can say, did you contact Capital One? Did you contact Portfolio Recovery? How did you contact them? When did you contact them? Okay. Now in litigation, we find out for sure. And that's what's called the ACDV. That's the, you got the Bureau Furniture, the communication pipeline is called eOscar. And that's where information flows back and forth is in that eOscar. And we get that in litigation. All right, so I think this will be the last one uh, from Timothy. I have involuntary repo. There's no data on my payment history. Do I still use same strategy? Yeah, that's what I would use. I'd say, here's the open date, you know, May the 9th, 2019. And from May 9th or from May 2019 through the present, if they're still reporting a balance, I want to know what my payment history is. If they're missing that, so uh, TransUnion might have an X and say unknown. Uh, Experian might have ND for no data. And Equifax will have like the little crosshatch thing that says, you know, unknown or no data available. You say, I, I want the data for each one of these months. Where is it? This looks incomplete without it. Why don't you have this? Please give this to me. And then see what they do. Oftentimes they will not give it to you. And then you need to talk to a lawyer about that. All right, guys. Well, listen, I uh, appreciate you being here and I uh, hope you have a fabulous rest of your weekend and I will talk to you soon. Okay. Have a good one. Bye-bye.